Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala al-mab'uuthi rahmatan lil-alameen. Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to this new episode of Ask Huda, being broadcasted to you live from Cairo, Egypt. And until you make your fall, make your uh, phone call and you will find inshallah the numbers displayed at the bottom of your screen we have as usual a number of emails uh, brother Ali asks a frequently asked question he says how do I answer to a man who is asking me why does Allah create us and tests us if you say that Allah is most merciful why didn't he create us and put us directly in paradise. Thanks, Sheikh. First of all, it is one of the biggest mistakes anyone could do when he thinks that he is peer to Allah Azza wa Jal and he talks to Allah or questions Allah as if Allah is one of us. Akhi, don't you know who Allah is? Allah the Almighty is the creator of the heavens and the earths. Allah the Almighty is the one who owns everything you see and everything you do not see. To the extent that if Allah were to destroy everything in this universe, is anyone going to hold him accountable for that? Can anyone question Allah Azza wa Jal? The answer is no. Therefore, this question would not have arised if people knew Allah Azza wa Jal and knew how exalted He is, subhanahu wa ta'ala, praise and glory be to Him, the Almighty Allah Azza wa Jal. And hence, one should not try to question Allah's acts, Allah's deeds, because as Allah mentioned in the Quran, لا يسأل he is not questioned about what he acts and decides while everyone else is. Nevertheless, Allah Azza wa Jal, we have to acknowledge that he is the most knowledgeable, that he is the most just and fair, that he is the owner of everything. If you believe in this, then you have no other choice you have no other alternative but to submit your will to Allah and to do what Allah has created you for, and that is to worship Him. So this person asking a question, why didn't Allah Azza wa put us in paradise? I would ask you a similar question. Why would Allah Azza wa put you in paradise? What for? What do you have so that Allah would put you in paradise? It is Allah who had created you, and it is Allah Azza wa Jal who is testing you, and Allah gave you the free will to choose. You want to go to paradise? Go ahead. It's only a few years and you will die. If you want to enjoy these few years and defy His orders, go ahead. Few years and you'll go to hell. So you have no other choice but to love Him, but to be submissive to Him, but to be His servant and slave, and do exactly what he tells you because he the Almighty has the upper hand and he does what he does for a wisdom and for a legitimate reason you may know it and you may fail to do so we have a caller a sister Aisha from Saudi Assalamu alaikum Assalamu alaikum uh, Sheikh I have one question yes uh, can you give me a reference regarding the duty of a wife towards her household work and also if it is mandatory or only desirable on her. Okay, 
I will answer your question, inshallah. Uh, Sister Aisha asks a question and she, she says, what is the difference of a woman serving and uh, working in her house and is it mandatory or recommended? Scholars differed on the ruling of a woman working in her house. Is it mandatory? Is it obligatory? Is it recommended? Is it only permissible? So they have a lot and a lot of material wrote uh, or written in this. Some say it depends on the standard of her parents living. So if she came from a house where she had servants, in this case, her husband is obliged to provide her with such. Others say that no, she is not obliged to serve or to work at all because she was married to fulfill her husband's desires, so they say. And she's not obliged to do anything else. Now, the most authentic opinion, and this is a choice of Sheikh Islam bin Taymiyyah and uh, a number of great scholars of Islam, they said that it is mandatory upon a woman to obey her husband. In ma'roof, in what is normal and accepted, so if a husband tells his wife, stand on your right leg for a couple of hours, she's not obliged to obey him. It's not Simon Says. But if he wants food, if he wants his house tidy and clean, if he wants to have uh, new uh, fresh clothes and ironed, or to uh, take care of his uh, house or of his uh, uh, sons, then this is the obligation of his wife. Where did we get this from? From a number of hadiths where the Prophet والسلام, had his daughter Fatima working at the house of his cousin and her husband Ali until she got her hand affected by the hard work she used to do. And when she went to ask the Prophet والسلام, for assistance he, w w to help her, he didn't tell her it's your husband's obligation to bring you uh, or to prov provide for you uh, uh, a servant or a maid. And he didn't give her from his own, but rather he told her, I should tell you something that is much better than this. So this indicates to us that had it not been mandatory for her to work, the prophet would have told her, you're not obliged to work. But he did not say this. And she is, or she was his daughter, so this means definitely that a woman's role in her house is to work and serve, as it is the role for a man outside the house to work and to put uh, uh, the food on the table. There are a number of different hadiths, uh, uh, likewise. Uh, as for the Quran, Surah Yusuf, the uh, uh, wife of Al-Aziz, Allah Azza wa Jal described him to be her master. وَأَلْفَيَا سَيِّدَهَا Her master was standing at the door. And a, a husband is a master. And a master rules and orders his slave or his servant or his wife to do what is needed to do. But this is dependent on the word ma'roof, which is the norm, which is acceptable among everyone else. Which means that it is not part of a ma'roof. When, my, when your husband tells you to serve his parents, his siblings, their children, and to clean and cook for them, this is not part of your duties, and it's not mandatory at all. It's mandatory upon the husband to provide the wife with a separate house. If she's willingly uh, uh, accepting to serve his parents, uh, uh, and she's doing this to gain his love, may Allah reward her, she's rewarded for that. We have a, f a phone call. Uh, Sister Maryam from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? I'm fine. Zakumullah khair for asking. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to speak to you. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Sheikh, I want to, I want to ask, I want to ask you advice. I want to separate my sister to with her husband. Because her husband 
is not a responsible husband, but they have uh, four children. And my sister now, she's, she's uh, living in Manila and her husband in, in our province. I advise to my sister, don't go home to, to our province unless your husband didn't change to drink wine, to, to smoke, and to play gambling. This one I don't like because this one is haram. I advise to my sister, then, my, I to my sister, if your husband didn't stop to doing this, you you separate him. I, I like to do that because it's my decision to my sister. Thank you very much, sir. Sister, You're quite uh, welcome. Sheikh Jasakalaw. What Jasakum? Okay. Uh, sister Mariam's question, uh, if I understood it correctly, her sister is living in Manila and she has four children while her husband is back home in their province, but he drinks alcohol and he plays, uh, uh, he, he gambles and he doesn't support her. So she wants to give her sister advice to separate from such a person. Would that be uh, uh, permissible or not? First of all, we have to understand that Allah Azza wa Jal ordered a woman to obey her husband as long as this is not in sins or in disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal. Second of all, the Prophet said alayhi salam, Laysa minna man amra'atan ala zawjiha. He is not from among us who turns a wife against her husband. Now, is this generally speaking or not? No, this is not generally speaking. This is in normal conditions. When the husband is okay, but when the husband is deviant or corrupt or being married to him is far greater in harm than being divorced, then this is a different case. So in, in, instead of going and encouraging her, uh, her to divorce him because he plays, he gambles and he uh, drinks intoxicants, he's not practicing, try to advise her to remind him of Allah Azza wa to try to exert her effort in calling him back to Islam. If this fails and he doesn't provide for her or for her children, she has all the right to ask for separation. But this should be the last thing she uh, uh, opts for. Uh, we have a caller, Abdel Nasser from Libya. Brother Abdel Nasser? From Libya. Sheikh, Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I have two questions. Yes, Akhi. And my first question, I want to know, we, the Ahli Sunnah, Wal Jamaa, we have only two books we must obey always. One, Kitabullah, Wa Sunnah al Rasul. And I want to know a lot of hadith. How should I know this hadith is authentic so I can always obey that hadith? And I want to know Bukhari, Wal Muslim. Every hadith came from them is authentic. And this Abi and Muslim, I want to know, are they Sahaba or I want to know the Ahli? And secondly, question, I want to know the difference between Al Nasara and Masihin. These two, are they the same? Not. Which one of them, if he came, we the Muslims should eat the meat. Al Nasara or Al Masih, I want to know the difference between two of them. Okay. Sheikh, may I let Okay, I've got your questions, Akhi. I will answer you, inshallah. Uh, Brother Abdel Nasser from Libya had two questions. The first question was regarding the authenticity of hadiths. How can I know if this hadith is authentic or not? Well, I, I would ask Brother Abdel Nasser, how would you know what an ayah of the Quran means, whether it means this or not? The answer he would say, by knowing Arabic and going to the books of tafsir said, correct. So if you don't know Arabic, you won't be able. So you have to refer to someone who knows Arabic. How about 
the different views of tafsir. Which one is the most authentic opinion that this is the interpretation of the ayah? He said, we have to refer to the scholars of tafsir because not all these interpretations are correct. He said, okay, this is good. We're doing good un until now. Likewise with the books of hadith. If you read a hadith, you will find that there is rules and regulations that govern studying this hadith. It's called ilm mustalah al-hadith. And there is another ilm that studies the chain of narrators. Ilm al-rijal, ilm al-jarh wa ta'deel. So these are a number of sciences governing the hadith that would purify it, protect it, and tell us whether it is authentic or not. And this is done only by scholars. If the doctor gives me medication, how would I know if this medication is suitable for my illness or not? I trust the doctor. He's a scholar in his science, and he knows what he's doing. But I cannot open the drawer and pick any medication and say that this, inshallah, would cure my uh, a sinus or my headache. It has to be prescribed by a scholar. So there are scholars of hadith. Among them were Al-Imam Al-Bukhari and Al-Imam Muslim, the compilers of Sahih Al-Bukhari and Sahih Al-Imam Muslim. And they were the highest grade and degree of knowledge in hadith. They were not companions. They were not followers of the companions, but they were in the early or the late uh, uh, 100s, uh, uh, the, th the second century and the beginning of the third century. And they had a lot of connection with narrators of the hadith who relayed the hadith from the Prophet ﷺ to their time with a chain of narrators. So they know what they were uh, uh, compiling and the scholars who came before them and after them know that as well. As for your second question, uh, Brother Abdul Nasser, Al Nasara and Al Masihiyun are the same. They are all followers of Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. They are called Al Nasara in the Quran. They are called an nasara in the Sunnah. Now, we call them as Allah has called them. Now, nowadays, people tend to call them they are al masihiyin Why is that? Because they attribute them as followers of Al-Masih, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And this name is wrong because Allah did not call them al masihiyin Allah called them an nasara However, they are the same thing. So the slaughtering of the Nasara or of the Masihiyin is the same, and all these rulings are the same to us, inshallah, Azza wa Jal. Ambrin says, I'm living in the United Arab Emirates. Whenever I order from grocery shop, I give some tip to the delivery man but I don't know if all of them are Muslim or not. Will this be considered as sadaqah in every case? As I don't go out much, I don't get a chance to give sadaqah. First of all, in order for your charity to be accepted, it has to be for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. We sometimes fail to attain this intention and we give people tips because we are embarrassed of them. So we feel a little bit uh, agitated, so we give them, though we don't want to give them. And then we try to, you know, uh, um, think of it as charity or a sadaqah. This is not sadaqah. Now, this grocery man or boy, if he is really poor, and your intention is to help any poor person you see, and you give him money, this is sadaqah. But, in the Emirates, there are charity organizations that would utilize your money, that would take your money and give it to the Muslims. 
So, Sheikh, isn't it permissible for us to give charity to the non-Muslims? It is permissible. But you have to prioritize. If your brother, your sibling is starving, and your third cousin is starving, who should you be kind to if you cannot be kind except to one? Definitely your brother is closer and he is more worthy of being uh, uh, cared for than anyone else. Therefore, I would advise you to select and choose the Muslims as they are in far greater need than anyone else. And by this you would utilize, inshallah, uh, uh, all of uh, your money in the cause of Allah Azza wa Jal. Najma says, is it allowed for a Muslim to correct another Muslim in public? Now, if you correct someone in public, this might be permissible and it might be not permissible, depending on the person speaking in public, depending on the consequences, depending whether you are 100% certain of what you are correcting him of or not, depending of your intention itself. See, if a person is speaking in public and he says something that is wrong, are you 100% sure that he is wrong? Maybe it is something of dispute among scholars. So you cannot correct him in public when there is a difference of opinion among scholars. Secondly, what are the consequences? If he's calling people to something in Islam, sometimes you find da'is saying something and teaching people and all of a sudden someone stands and debates with him. So instead of giving da'wah to the people, now this person by correcting the da'i or the, the person or the lecturer, he is repelling people away from Islam over something that can be rectified and corrected later on. And what is your intention? Is your intention to sincerely correct him or to show off and to reprimand him and show the people how ignorant or small he is? All of these factors add to the answer of your question. We have a caller. Muhammad from Saudi. Brother Muhammad. Yes. Yes, Akhi, what's your question? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Sheikh. Wa alaikum wa wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question. Can you uh, just to explain to us what is the ruling of surrogacy in Islam? What do you mean by uh, surrogacy? Surrogacy is uh, the hiring the uterus for giving birth to the baby. Okay. I got you. In which the sample of the sperm and the egg is from the uh, husband and the wife. Okay. Any more and questions? I have, I have one more part of the same question that if the surrogate is the sister. Okay. Uh, then uh, can you please explain to me this? I things? will have answer your question, inshallah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You're welcome, Akhi. Uh, Brother Muhammad from Saudi Arabia, uh, he's asking about the ruling on using a surrogate mother. And this is an issue where the scholars studied thoroughly. And they concluded that this is totally prohibited. Because though the egg is from the wife and the sperms are from the husband, yet the woman carrying the child is not the mother, is not the real mother, is not the wife. So the scholars said that the majority of the DNA would be shared by the donor uh, a wife and by the surrogate mother. And this would cause the lineage to be disrupted and mixed, whether she is the sister of the wife or a total stranger. It doesn't make any difference. So IVF and all of these procedures are totally haram and not permissible except if the egg is from the wife, the sperm is from the husband, and the woman who is impregnated, who is pregnant with the fetus, is the wife herself. Other than that, it is not permissible 
at all. And this is to protect the lineage of uh, uh, the child. May Allah Azza wa grant you the children in halal way through means you do not anticipate of. We have a caller. Uh, Muhammad from the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam to Allah. Sheikh, I have three questions. Okay. The first one is when uh, some maris, we, uh, we recite Surah Fatiha and other surah on water and give him, is that permissible? N number two. Is this in marriage? <laughs> Sorry? Is this in marriage or when you get sick? No, when get sick or normally in uh, normal days, my wife, uh, she used to recite Surah Fatiha and uh, other surah, Atul Kursi, and give to my daughter and son. Okay, second so, question. Uh, uh, second question, uh, if we are going for a picnic uh, in a mountain area or something, and we got a time for Salah for uh, Maghrib, and uh, uh, we stay there for late till Isha. Is that permissible when we have a Maghrib, we can immediately offer our uh, Salah for Isha, or we can wait and afterwards we can do the Isha prayers? So are you traveling or just a picnic? No, just a picnic from one city to another city. Oh, so it is traveling from one city to the other city? Yeah. Okay, third question. The third question is, uh, I go sometime to a musalla near to my uh, house, and uh, there the imam who prays, uh, sometimes he says, uh, instead of Rabbana lakal uh, he said, uh, Rabb, uh, Sami Allah leman hamid, instead of hamida. Is that allowed? Okay. Any more questions? No, thank you very much, Sheikh. You're welcome, Akhi. Okay, I think we have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Brother Muhammad from the Emirates, just before the break, had three questions. The first one, was that his wife seems to want to protect him and her children by reciting Al-Fatiha and other surahs on the Quran and making them drink from it. So is this permissible? Generally speaking, this is okay, but I do not recommend it. Why is that? This procedure is, is usually followed when you have an illness, so it is a means of healing, not a means of protection. So if a person is sick, if a person has evil eye, envy, black magic, etc., he may follow this procedure by reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, Ayat Al-Kursi, the last two ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah, the last three surahs of the Quran, the three quls, and blowing on Zamzam water or normal water and drinking from it, washing his face or the affected area with it. This is okay. This was mentioned by some of the companions and the tabi'een uh, as a means of healing. So there is no problem in that. But to do this on regular basis, when you have nothing wrong with you, to take it as a, a form of protection. I would not recommend this though. The Quran is a source of healing and protection, and if someone does it, inshallah, he is not sinful for doing so. Uh, Brother Muhammad, second question is that if we go from one city to the other for the reason of a picnic, would it be permissible for us to combine and shorten the prayers? Scholars say that shortening the prayers must be in a travel that is considered to be hard for the individual. So whenever there is hardship and the journey itself is considered to be traveling, then you may do so. And this is why sometimes we get questions of people commuting between their places of residency and the uh, place of work. 
So in the Emirates, for example, people who live in Dubai and work in Abu Dhabi, or vice versa. Is it permissible for them to shorten prayers? This depends on the community itself, the local community. If they say that it is a traveling distance and there is a, a hardship in it and we usually travel and shorten prayer, in this case you may do so. But the majority of Muslims consider the distance as short and they commute maybe once or twice a day to that area. Hence, the scholars say it is highly recommended not to shorten the prayer. Joining the prayer is easier because this can be done in traveling and it can be done in residency depending on the need for it. So if there is no convenience for you to uh, pray, the time on, uh, the pray the prayer on time and you would like to combine Maghrib to Isha, this can be done inshallah. We have a, a phone call. Sister Maryam from Kuwait. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu Sheikh, I have me a question. Yes. It is permissible in Islam the changing the family name of the child to the family head to the mother. Okay, and what about his father's name? Uh, father is not the, the father's name. Yeah, wh where is his father? Why do you want to call the child after his mother? Because he's not supporting her to the her child for how many long years. Okay, I will answer your question, inshallah. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Jazakum. Uh, Brother Muhammad from the Emirates says that he prays behind an imam, and the imam, after saying, Sami Allahu liman hamidah, he doesn't say it correctly. He says, Sami Allahu liman hamid. And if this is correct, then the imam has to be advised. Because saying, Sami Allahu liman hamidah, is a verbal act which is obligatory in prayer. So if a person does not say it, or if a person says it in a wrong way, knowing how to say it in the right way, then he has to prostrate, prostration of forgetfulness, if he did it unintentionally or out of ignorance. But if he deliberately changed it, then his prayer is invalid. And most likely, I would guess and think, that the brother leading the prayer is not getting close to the microphone enough. So when he raises his head, he says, Sami Allahu liman hamidah. So the ha, hamidah, this is very uh, um, quiet. And you think that he said, Sami Allahu liman hamid. As some people, when they go for Allah, Akbar, said, Allahu Akbar. And you don't hear Akbar, the rest of it. But definitely any Muslim knows that he had said it. And even if you did not hear it, it is still counted. So I would advise you to go and speak to this brother, this Imam, and try to have him rectify it and uh, uh, say it correctly. Maryam from Kuwait says, is it permissible to change a child's name to his mother's name? The answer is, this is not permissible at all. As long as the child was born out of correct marriage, not out of wedlock, it is mandatory that he is called after his father. Even if his father was a criminal or a drug, drug dealer, even if his father rejected Islam and apostatized, even if his father was not providing for his son and never saw his son in his entire life, still this is Allah's law that a child is called only after his father and the family of his father. His mother name must not be given to a child unless the child was born out of wedlock. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Uh, we have a call. Sister Uruj from Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamualaikum. Uh, Sheikh, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, first is uh, like um, in, uh, here in Jeddah, we have uh, the in the car showrooms, we have the companies who uh, give, uh, like, they sell out cars on installments. Now, the thing is that somebody told us that the, the markup is actually that 
the riba and sood we can entrust we cannot uh, in take buy any car on installment so i want to know whether we can do it or not like we can uh, buy a car on this basis or not okay secondly uh, somebody told my mother that salat al duha that we uh, pray it should not be called salat al duha it should be called uh, salat al awabin i don't like i I yeah, know. I understand. Okay. Okay. So uh, well, she was she was like asking that uh, is it mandatory to call this like the person who told her she was saying that we should not call it Salatul Duha, we should call this by the other name. Okay. Uh, and, and, and one more question. Uh, yes, I forgot to ask one more. Um, uh, like my grandfather, my uh, we we belong to Pakistan, and my grandfather had a house in uh, Peshawar. So what happened is that when he died, he just told. like that house was transferred on my grandmother's name and uh, all the uh, the brothers that, that that piece of land actually they demolished the old building and they decided like my father and his brother uh, brothers they decided that they will build an, a new house and it will be on their mother's name and they all participated and invested in that now my grandfather mother has also died and she actually did not like uh, told in her wasiya that this house belongs to whom now it, uh, what should they do as they have all have participated and invested in the house and she did not uh, like like she did not mentioned any name so we want to know what what is the ruling on this and it was actually uh, it was in a like she told one of her uh, sons that uh, my it is her like uh, wish that her youngest daughter uh, she, as she is still living in that house so she keeps on living and it was a wish that it should be on her name so what should be done okay your your grandfather when he died he wrote the house in someone's of uh, some of his uh, children's name no 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 what the the children did my like my father and their um, and the, the all the brothers they demolished the old building and they rebuilt the say uh, the house on the same piece of land okay and okay. they uh, like it was on their mother's name uh, name and after that after her she, they, she did not like um, make it on anybody's name okay i understand any more questions oh. no thank you very much you're welcome i'll answer you inshallah sister raihana from saudi sister raihana yes sister assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh she asked me a few questions yes uh, first one is as i know there is no prayer without surah fatiha but my one of my friends said that she read on uh, islam q and a that it's not mandatory in the third and fourth rakah it's just a sunnah so i wanted to know if it is correct and the second question is if a woman dies can her husband and daughter both uh, of them can they give her birth this is my second question who and who? who and who husband and daughter both husband and daughter together okay جزاك الله خيرا سلام عليكم جزاك الله brother muhammad from nigeria yeah from nigeria yeah اخي what can i do for you ما اعرف ادبادو ان my father did for the that our we call dad to what I, I'm, i'm not able to understand your question ya muhammad after the, my father like my father when he died okay if your father has died he died yeah wa he died she lived six then and five plus avana five men five boys and six men for the god wa ma khan ko god wallahi ya akhi i'm unable to understand your question if you can inshallah talk to the control and they relay the inshallah طيب Uh, Aruj from Saudi Arabia she says what's the ruling on buying cars in installments now buying car in installments are yani deceiving the name there are two ways of buying cars in installments one to buy it directly from the owner so you go to the owner how much is this car it is 100000 riyals if you pay cash if you want to pay in installments over the period of 4 years time or 5 years or whatever then it is x amount 120000 130000 you both agree and you decide that to buy it on installments and you sign the contract you give the down payment or there is no down payment no problem 
providing everything is listed and clarified, then the car is given to you and it's in your name from day one. You trash the car, you use the car, you sell the car, it's up to you. You have four years to pay your dues in it. This is halal, if you're buying it from the owner. Now the second scheme, which is widely spread in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, is a scheme that is not permissible because there is a lot of injustice in it. The car dealers know that if they give you the car from day one and you sell it, they find a very difficult time trying to get their money back, not always, but most of the time uh, uh, during these four years. So they came up with a devious and uh, uh, plan that stated that, listen, we don't sell you, we lease you. And you say, okay, now your intention is to buy, their intention is to sell, but they camouflage this so that they would cheat you if they had to, and they would preserve their right to do whatever they want because it's a lease. And they write a contract with you four or five years that this happens, you have to do these payments, and the car remains in their name. So during these five years, if you manage to give them their money on time, at the end of the five years, they give you the car, either for free or for a very minute amount of money. But if anything were to happen during these five years, they have all the right to possess the car and all the money that you had paid previously is gone down the drain. Not only that, if a car comes and demolishes your car completely, not your mistake, your car is properly parked, but the last month before collecting and owning the car, you paid the four years and the 11 months on time. The last month, a car comes and demolishes the car completely or the car burns by itself. You go to them in fear and uh, this is not something I had done. So, no, don't worry, akhi, don't worry, the car is insured. So, alhamdulillah. Okay, what to do? Said so, nothing. Okay, where's my car? Oh, your car was burnt to the ground. Okay, well, then I had paid for four years and 11 months. Yeah, you were leasing. Yeah, but the insurance company gave you a new car. Yeah, they gave us, not you. Anyhow, we would give you a discount. We can lease you the new car with new terms and for four or five uh, more years. Actually, this is embezzlement. This is cheating. And they are using the, the public for their own uh, safe. And I believe that this is uh, not permissible. The second question is calling Salatul Duha by the name of Salatul Awabin. Yes, its name is Salatul Awabin as well, because the Prophet ﷺ called it as such. However, he himself called it a duha, and it was known among the companions by Salatul Duha. Therefore, what your friend said is completely uh, uh, baseless. Abu Huraira said that my companion وسلم, advised me of three things, I will never leave them until I die. Among them, is to pray two rak'ahs of duha every day. So the name is well known among scholars and what your friend is telling you is totally baseless. Now, the third question is a long one, but in a nutshell, a person, their grandfather died. So the siblings, the sons of this man who died and his wife would have their share in the property they had inherited. Now. Most people would do a very generous and kind thing to, uh, uh, to do, and that is to give the house to their mother so that in the future, six, five uh, years down the line, no one would say, listen, I'd like to sell the house, I need my share. And then their mother would be without any place to live in. So out of courtesy, the, sib the, the siblings, the, the offspring of the deceased said, okay, we donate everything to our mother and register the whole property in our mother's name. And after she dies, everything goes back to us again because we are inheriting. Now the mother died not leaving a will. And Akhi, even, or sister, even if, you, if your mother died and left a will to one of her children, the will is canceled and is void. It is not permissible to have a will to one that will inherit. Therefore, she intended, she said, she ordered the property to go to her youngest daughter or the one who was not married. All of this is invalid. 
the minute she dies, we have to look at the sons and the daughters and give them their share. If she had a father or a mother, they would have a share, but most likely they are too old and they died before her. So now the children, uh, we have to divide the whole wealth, the property, the cash, the gold, the clothes, according to uh, the Quran, where the male gets twice as much as the female. So we divide the whole thing over shares, two shares for the uh, uh, male and one share for the uh, female, and then we can tell how much they would get. Uh, Rayhana said that there is no Salat without Fatiha. And her friend heard on uh, Huda or in Islam Q&A that it is not mandatory in the third and in the fourth rak'ah. And the biggest problem is not the fatwa itself, but those who relay the fatwa to us. See, I know for certain that Islam Q&A would never say something like that because I know the, the site quite well. Now your friend most likely mixed up Al-Fatiha, which is a pillar of Salat, and it is mandatory to be recited in each and every rak'ah if you are an Imam or if you are an individual praying on your own. And it is mandatory upon every follower, ma'moom, to recite the Fatiha in silent rak'ahs. The third and fourth of Dhuhr, Asr, uh, and the third rak'ah of Maghrib. Now, w uh, when we come, and then Isha as well, the third and fourth of Isha. Now, when we come to your friend, most likely she was reading in Islam Q&A about the ruling on reciting the surah after the Fatiha. So if this is the case, then yes, it is not mandatory to recite the second surah after the Fatiha. It is highly recommended and not mandatory. It is highly recommended to be recited in the first and second surah, uh, the first and second rak'ah for the Imam and for the individual. It is not permissible to recite a surah after the Fatiha in loud rak'ahs for the follower because he can only recite the Fatiha, but nothing else. And if a person does not recite a surah after the Fatiha in all four rak'ahs, his prayer is still valid, but he has missed a uh, sunnah. Uh, brother, uh, Sister Rehana's second question is that when a woman dies, can she be washed by her husband and her daughter? And the answer is yes. When mother, when, when, when Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu may Allah be pleased with her, died, it was Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, who was her husband, who washed her. And this is refuting what some schools of thought claim that once a man dies, or once a woman dies, the spouse becomes a non-mahram because the marriage contract has been dissolved. This is totally baseless. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, Aisha, how is it if you die and I, would to, I were to wash you? And when he died, alayhi salatu wasalam, Mother Aisha said, if it were to me and my co-wives, none would have washed the Prophet wasalam, except his wives. And when Abu Bakr died, may Allah be pleased with him, his wife Asma bint Umais, may Allah be pleased with her, was the one to wash him. So from all these hadiths, definitely this school of thought did not make the right ruling when it said that the marriage contract is void and it's broken the minute one of the spouses dies. This is baseless. So yes, a man can wash his wife after her death, and so can her daughter give, gives him a hand because she's a mahram, so they can both uh, help one another in doing so without any problem. Khansa uh, says, I had some nail polish on the time I did not have to pray. So the question is frequently asked. A woman in her menses has nail polish. When time for her to make ghusl, she takes ghusl and prays. She did this, but only to notice that there is a small 
uh, fragment of nail polish on her nail. So is her prayer valid or must she remove this, make ghusl again and pray? The answer is the latter. She has to remove the nail polish and she has to renew her ghusl and she has to repeat the prayer she prayed with it because this deters and stops and prevents water from reaching the skin or the nail itself. And hence, the ghusl uh, is not valid and subsequently, the prayer is not valid. This is all the time we have. Until we meet next time, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keeping my heart.